All right. Um, so tonight, uh, I want to talk through a little bit about um, how I use caching in Micronaut. Um, I've gotten a couple of questions on this um, and, and comments on previous videos. And I think it's worthwhile to walk through like a pretty detailed example of um, how to use caching effectively. Um, and in particular, I want to walk through one of the screens of XDividend, uh, the app that I'm working on. And um, a lot of the data here uh, can be cached uh, for various amounts of time, uh, fairly regularly on and off. Um, and one of the screens that I want to take a look at is the watch list screen because this screen has um, a bunch of unique properties. Uh, it needs data from a bunch of different sources. And uh, a lot of the data, or some of the data at least, can be cached uh, quite a bit. So anytime uh, I move back and forth here, um, I can pretty much cache just about all of this data. And uh, some of it you know, might be cached for the entire day or longer. Some of it might only be cached for a couple of minutes. Um, and, and some of it will be cached for days, right? So if you'll see, you know, the stock ticker and the symbol and the company name, that's gonna be cached for a couple of days. The quote, um, depending on if it's after hours or during the stock market hours, we might cache it only for, uh, you know, a minute or two or less than that, or, or, you know, when it's off hours, we might cache it for longer. Um, and then uh, the upcoming dividend uh, here, uh, we're gonna cash potentially for quite a bit. Um, companies pay dividends on different uh, schedules. Some pay it quarterly, uh, some are uh, you know, monthly uh, even. And so a lot of this information can be um, cached for much longer. So uh, we're gonna take a look at this as kind of an end-to-end -end example of how um, if you use uh, caching effectively, you can really, really, really improve um, the time in which it takes to uh, to to query for this data. So uh, let's take a look at this. So uh, at the foundation of this, um, we have uh, a GraphQL query, which uh, allows you to get uh, the watch list. Okay, and um, the watch list item or each item in this row is represented by this object. Um, it has an ID in the database, which means, hey, uh, you know, as a, as a user, right, I have a list of things that I'm watching, and, um, you know, that's the, the database ID itself. Uh, the symbol, meaning the stock ticker, so uh, that right there. Uh, company name, uh, which is the, the full name of the company. Uh, and then these two items here, quote, and recent dividends. So the quote is obviously what we use over here to uh, show, uh, you know, an update live, um, how the price is doing for the current day. Uh, and then obviously recent dividend we use down here to try and say, hey, this is when an upcoming payment is coming or when did they last pay a dividend, uh, things like that. And um, a bunch of this data comes from different places. So the ID and the symbol uh, come from the database. Uh, the company name comes from uh, the search service or a, a search um, system that I have that is uh, backed actually by a embedded SQLite database. Um, the quote data comes from my uh, data provider uh, or from the cache. Um, and the recent dividend also comes from my data provider or the database or the cache. So uh, GraphQL can neatly kind of stitch a lot of this stuff together. Um, and so I'll walk you through top to bottom um, how this works and, and how I've structured it um, and talk about kind of the, the, the way that I've done this. So let's take a look at like the first thing that has to happen. So before we can even fetch the quote or the recent dividend or the company name, we need a list of symbols, right? We need to see, uh, we need to know what you're grabbing. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at that. Um, and we will also see, you know, roughly how long that takes. Um, because uh, that'll kind of give us a, 
uh, it'll it'll at least give you give you a baseline for like hey how this um you know how this performs and how much better uh things get with caching so um so the first thing that that happens right is it goes to the database and so if we look at the watch list query uh, the watch list service, if you will, right? This is going against our Firestore database uh, and it's getting the watch list. Uh, I do not have any caching on getting the watch list. I probably could um, and it'd be relatively easy to do. Um, but since this is something that can change with user, uh, user changes and things like that, I'm not caching it. Um, it would be pretty simple to cache um, and to cache it correctly. Um, but for now, I'm not. And so, you know, again, this is just the straight database query against against the Firestore database. It's um, shouldn't be, you know, anything too um, anything too heavy. Let's go ahead and rerun this. Uh, so let's see how long this takes, right? So just to get our watch list, the ID, and the symbol, which this is this is what comes from the database. Um, this took us about 1.5 seconds, okay? And you know, in a in a better world, usually you'll get a little better, 90 sec, uh, 90 milliseconds, right? Um, you know, 267, right? So it's it's variable, right? It's a call to a database or a call to an external service, right? So, um, but this is kind of our baseline, right? So, you know, call it. We're starting at roughly, call it 200 to 300 milliseconds. And as we add more data in here, this is gonna get worse and worse, right? So when we go to fetch the quote or the recent dividend, both of those things come from different uh, different different kind of data sources and have different caching properties. So those could take a while. So uh, let's go ahead and add in a quote here and we'll just say, give me the latest price, the latest time, uh, the change and the change percent, right? So this is going to go through, um, and at the same time, it's going to grab quotes for all of these things, right? And so again, we were at 300 milliseconds. This is with nothing in the cache. Let's go ahead and run this, right? Uh, so, okay, so now we're up to a second, right? Or almost a second. Um, and if I do this again, I will hit the cache, and I should get much faster, right? So now I'm back down to um 100 milliseconds so back down to you know nearly where we were with the symbol so this is why caching is so important if you can cache uh this will make things much 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 faster all right so let's dive in and see how this is done uh how i structure this um and it'll give you a better sense of what's going on so i have a kind of a two-tiered cache system uh, Micronaut has um, the annotation uh, 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 cacheable, uh, very similar to what Spring has. And so I really have three, uh, you know, kind of three layers. I have a, a, a layer of um, a Firestore database in Google Cloud. And um, if we take a look at that, right, um, that's actually a great place to start. And that is where I actually start to actually cache things. So I have an in-memory cache um, that I have configured for quotes. And um, these quotes um, are cached for a relatively short amount of time, uh, but they are they are cached in memory. Uh, we're talking, you know, on the order uh, of a couple of seconds, right? Um, and <clears throat> you'll see the two uh, things, or maybe, well, three things that are relevant here, right? Um, Whenever we save a quote, we do a cache put, meaning we invalidate and we resave something uh, into the cache. Um, and the get quote and get quotes, right, are both cacheable. So um, now these have different keys. So when you're asking for a list, uh, you have a different key than when you're asking for a quote. Um, but in practice, for me, uh, that seems to work out okay. Um, but so if you were to just get a single quote, um, this would check Firestore. If it has a recent quote, uh, it will return that and then it will cache it for um, you know, a, a standard period of time. Uh, one thing to note here is this uh, 
function signature looks a little funky and that's because currently uh, Micronauts caching layer or caching annotation does not support coroutines. Um, there have been some recent changes in, and commits in some of the latest versions of Micronaut that should allow um, uh, the folks to um, make this cacheable annotation work with coroutines, uh, but currently it doesn't work right now. So this is why you see this uh, kind of interesting looking fun function signature, right? Um, and, and so let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, and the best way to do that is just with a quick example. Uh, so let's go ahead and create a file here and do an example of this. Uh, so what we're really, uh, and, I'll, and I'll try and kind of make this a little cleaner, right? So we have this request, right? And um, it says, hey, give me the watch list and it returns a list of things, right? Um, and, uh, or sorry, not the watch list, right? We have this thing that's like, hey, give me a quote and it might return you know, a value. And in another case, we might have um, uh, quotes, right? And this is gonna return you know, potentially a list of values, right? Um, and each of here is gonna take in um, the symbol, right? And this is gonna be a list of symbols, right? So, I pass in, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Google, whatever. I want to get, you know, what the current stock price is. I pass in a list of them, and I want to list back. So this is roughly kind of again what this, uh, what this Firestore interface is looking right. Like I can save, or I can get, and I can, you know, get many, right? Um, so I then have caching uh, annotations on here. Um, but the weird thing is, is that I have this coroutine scope equals dot future. And so what's the issue here? Um, if I were to put cacheable on these two functions, uh, what Micronaut is doing um, at, at compile time is, is essentially uh, wrapping this function, uh, as I understand it, with... Um, uh, basically a call to the cache, right? So you kind of get this wonderful behavior for free. Um, if your method returns null, it doesn't cache anything, but if you return a value, it will actually cache that value. Um, so the problem is, is that when you put suspend on the front of here or on these functions, um, Micronaut doesn't necessarily know how to uh, react and deal with that type of function. Um, and so what we want is we want our function to be, you know, asynchronous, right? Non-blocking uh, as well uh, as, um, you know, potentially use coroutines. So the way to do that is to actually bridge. And if you look, the coroutine, or sorry, the, uh, the non-blocking uh, interfaces in, in many frameworks, not just Micronaut, right? The basis for that is this thing called a completable future. Um, I'm not gonna go too deep into completable futures. It's kind of the, um, uh, you know, maybe we can do a, a separate stream on it later. That's not really the important thing, but the important thing is, is that if you wanna use the async non-blocking uh, cache version of, of these, you have to use completable future. Um, and in order to do this, um, you have to have this signature. You can't use suspend. Now, one of the things that I do quite often, uh, not necessarily in, in here, uh, but in other places is in order to get multiple things, um, within a, within this quotes, right, I will often just call this function, right? So I'll basically say uh, symbol dot uh, map, and then I'll say uh, quote it, right? So basically, you know, I return calling up to here. Uh, and, you know, I might just do return uh, Might just do that, right? Uh, so 
one of the things that I want to do in here is I want to actually run this um, in a coroutine because I want to try and make this call to quotes. I want to do it kind of in parallel. I want to do a bunch at once. I don't want to do it sequentially, right? So let's let's take a look at like a more complete example. So if I have a completable future and it returns a double, um, and let's say I do completable future supply async, um, and I return math.random, and as part of this, right, um, I'm just gonna sleep here, right? Let's say it takes me a second to get every quote. Um, you know, if I wanna get 10 quotes, or that's gonna take me roughly 10 seconds, but it's gonna happen sequentially, right? Uh, so let's do this. Um, yeah, so this will be a list of completable future uh, double, right? Okay, uh, so if I want to get, right, Apple, Microsoft, uh, like this, Um, you know, I'm going to want to, uh, get all of these. And again, these cacheable, uh, these cacheable annotations aren't actually going to work, but, um, I'm just going to go ahead and do this. So, um, you know, this is essentially what we want, but if we do this, this is going to take, you know, this is going to happen sequentially, which is bad. That's not necessarily what we want. Uh, so, in order to make this work with coroutines, there is uh, a cool little bridge um, that is in the Kotlin coroutines uh, package here. And let's take a look at the documentation. Um, Kotlin X coroutines future JDK 8. So this is a package, uh, like an extra package uh, that you can bring into your uh, bring into your app or your library. And it allows you to basically convert a coroutine scope or a block of work that uses coroutines into a completable future, okay? Uh, and so the way that you do that is you say this, and then uh, you do equal, right? You say coroutine scope. Um, you have to give it, and I'm just gonna give it default and then you say future. So now, as you see, as aided by this little squiggly, uh, you can now use coroutines within this block because again, you're within a scope and the quotes function is still, as you'll see, returning completable future. Uh, in this case, it, it changes uh, slightly, um, but uh, we'll, we'll fix that in a minute here too. So now we can get rid of this um, and we're going to do the same thing for this, right? Um, and we can write this, uh, here. And because we're in a coroutine, we can now use delay. Um, and we can do say one, uh, time unit dot seconds, right? So rather than thread dot sleep, we're going to use delay. Uh, oops, import. Oh yeah, it's yeah, it's just like this. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, in this case, we can put cacheable on here, right? Uh, because again, it's basically just seeing that this is a future, right? So if I do quotes, right, this is a completable future now. Uh, not a um, uh, not a coroutine, right? So if you do that, like I do that here, Micronaut knows how to deal with this because what it's seeing is, is it's, oh, this is just a completable future, right? But really what we're doing under the hood is a coroutine. 
Now you don't necessarily want to go out and use this all over the place, right? Um, if you can, uh, you should avoid using this um, just because the way the coroutines work and completable futures work are not uh, one to one. But in the, in the case where you know you need to bridge um, bridge some older uh, Java APIs or JDK APIs that aren't necessarily maybe up to speed with coroutines yet, um, this is a way to do it. So what happens when we do this, right? Uh, so um, this will work, but it's not necessarily, um, this isn't definitely uh, not necessarily what you, uh, what you want, right? Uh, so if we do this and then we do, um, Uh, what do we get? Uh, that is a completable future double. Let me just make sure I have my signatures right here. Uh, symbol dot map. Quote. Um, let me just do this for the sake of making this a little better. Okay, so if I run this, right, um, this is gonna take, uh, oops, here, let's do, let's just do this for dramatic effect, right? So if I run this and we get three, um, this is gonna take about 15 seconds to actually finish, right? Uh, it's gonna take five, five, and then five, right? Yeah, okay, so about 15 seconds, right? So this isn't necessarily good, but uh, because we are within a coroutine scope, uh, we can really make this a lot faster, right? So again, I'm gonna break it down to one second and we'll see it takes roughly three seconds for this to run. One, two, three, right? Uh, so one of the benefits of this and one of the benefits of using coroutines is um, you can Again, do things, um, you can do more than one thing at a time, all right? So what do I do in my APIs, right? So in this case, and in the case of this screen, right, I'm gonna be trying to get a whole bunch of these quotes at once. So really, I'm gonna be passing an Apple, an AbbVie, an Aflac, right? I'm gonna get a, be getting a bunch of these. And if I were to do these sequentially one after another, this call would take forever, right? It would take way more than uh, you know the roughly uh, second and a half to you know down to 100 milliseconds, right? So how do I do this? Um, so because we are within this context, we can uh, use coroutines and we can use the async functionality um, to make more of these things run all at the same time. Uh, so let's take a closer look at how to do that. Um, I am going to iterate over each of the symbols. Uh, I am then going to say, hey, I'm going to do this async and I'm going to ask for a quote, okay? And I'm gonna return and capture all of these things up into jobs. And so what we get here uh, is a list uh, of deferred or compute completable futures. Now, um, async, right, is telling this to um, do this uh, in parallel, right? So basically we're, we're creating one job for each uh, or one deferred for each each of the symbols and this is running and dispatching immediately. Uh, and then I'm awaiting all of these and returning them back, okay? This may not necessarily be ideal, that's fine. What, what, what we really want though is, is that if, if you pass a bunch of symbols in here, we wanna try and get as many of those symbols at the same time uh, and return them all at once. So this right here makes a huge, huge, huge difference. Uh, and you'll see if I run this, we now get those things uh, 
nearly immediately, okay? Um, but, uh, completed rule, future, ah, uh, yeah, we have to do, sorry, it dots, oh, wait, like that, right? So in this case, right now, when we, when we, um, when we run it, right, we get it almost immediately. And if we, um, make this go up, right? So if we say each quote takes three seconds, right? Um, if we don't do this in parallel, again, this will take much, much, much longer. But if we do this, this will still all take roughly three seconds. One, two, three, right? So now we can get many more of these. And because of this, because again, we've, we've um, run all of these jobs asynchronously, this will never take uh, more than roughly three seconds, right? So now we've just basically made it so that, you know, we have this um, this API here that looks synchronous and, you know, especially this function that, that could in theory take a ton of time, right? I mean, I've got uh, uh, quite a few uh, items in here. Um, this will never take, or this will only take as long as roughly the, the slowest one, right? So I use this to great effect uh, when I'm loading this page, okay? Um, in addition to this, I then obviously have then add caching onto this, right? So just like here, uh, I'm able to add caching. And so when these things get called with the same arguments uh, one after another, this then goes and gets it from memory, which is much, much, much faster, right? So again, if we take a look at this, the first time this thing gets called, right? And since it's probably out of the cache, uh, I got to restart this. So, um, so again, like let's like take a look at this, right? So this pattern I use, um, uh, you know, gives gives uh, the effect that we we showed earlier. Um, so if we go here, right, you know, getting a list of you know twenty some odd items from the database um, doesn't take that long, right? One point two seconds. Uh, if we add a quote for each of those things, right? So this run, the um, stuff is gonna take quite a bit longer because it has to get a quote for each of those items. But again, uh, we're doing this pattern. So we're doing this job of getting all the quotes um, effectively all at the same time. So this goes really, 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 really fast. Okay, and if we do this again, because everything's in the cache, it's even faster, right? So this basically uh, helps bring all of my calls down subsequently after things um, more and more and more. And it also has the benefit that the more people that use it are putting things in the cache. So the more things that will eventually be returned from the cache, right? Um, so let's take a look at a, the next thing, right? So now let's say we add the recent dividend and we wanna say we wanna get the amount, the X date, the payment date, um, the, uh, uh, the declare date, right? We need this information to show uh, what's, what's being paid, all that kind of stuff, right? We need the currency, right? So again, this is now, we're trying to get data from another source for all of these items. And if we see we load this, right, it'll take a little bit of time the first time it happens, right? Okay, now we're back up to a second. But if we run this again, it's back instant, right? It's back to less than 100 milliseconds. So uh, I use this pattern all over the place uh, in the X dividend server. Um, essentially anything that I can grab uh, and I can cache, I typically will have an API that allows me to get one item or get multiple items um, and I'm gonna cache it. And then I'm also going to, when I'm gonna cache it, I'm going to, um, or sorry, in addition to caching, I'm either gonna use coroutines to make sure that I'm fetching more than one item at once at the same time, right? So that, you know, I'm only slowed down by the slowest one. Um, and if I do need to bridge the gap, and I want to use coroutines with a Java API, such as the cacheable API that isn't compatible with the um, uh, Kotlin coroutines yet, right? I'm going to use this, you know, future shim, if you will, to uh, to work, right? So 
Um, let's uh, go ahead and look at, let's see here. I'm not sure if this is in here or not. Um, I just want to take a look and show, yeah, here we go, Micronaut Cache. So if we look at the issues here, right, um, uh, suspend functions with caching, right? This is an open issue. Um, there, was, there was, again, a recently some APIs that, that allowed you to write method interceptors to support Kotlin suspended, uh, suspend functions. So, you know, if we talk a little bit about, we talked a little bit about before, when you add cacheable, right, to a function like this, Micronaut needs to understand what's going in and then also what's coming out, right? What's going in is partly what's creating the cache key, so it knows how to look that thing up from the cache, and then what it needs to know what's going out, so it's like, oh, okay, I know how to get the actual value here that you want to cache. And unfortunately right now, uh, without this, um, uh, Micronaut just doesn't know how to handle this, but it does know how to handle um, a completable future, right? Um, so, you know, if you go into any of these, right, um, and you look at the async cache, right, you'll see all of these APIs are using completable future. So if your function returns a completable future, which is the what the vast majority of, of async APIs uh, are using in Java, um, Micronaut knows how to cache that and knows how to deal with that, um, but it doesn't know how to deal with that when it's a when it's a suspend function. So, um, you know, keys keys to this, right? Um, if you need to use the Micronaut caching APIs and you want to use coroutines to do something like this, um, clean up your code a little bit, uh, you have to use uh, this bridge here. Um, and that, that works really well. Um, haven't had any issues with it. Um, it's been running on the XDividend backend for, for quite some time now. Um, and again, this, this idea that you might have, uh, you know, an ability to get one, but then you also need uh, an API to get many. Um, just keep in mind that Kotlin makes it really easy and coroutines make it really easy to run a whole bunch of these things in parallel uh, without doing, um, you know, without writing code that, that seems uh, maybe a little verbose or, or more than you really need. Um, and you can get a ton of performance benefits, right? Like again, this is this is pulling back a ton of data from a bunch of different sources, you know, in under a hundred milliseconds when initially some of this data would take us well over a hundred milliseconds to get just on its own, right? We saw three different data sources that took, uh, you know, at least a hundred milliseconds to get and we pulled back, you know, nearly 20 items, 20 times three items, right? Each each of these uh, in under 100 milliseconds, right? So again, huge, huge, huge performance uh, gains and difference um, if if your data, um, if your data can kind of support caching, right? That's one thing. But also if you structure your APIs um, and your code in such a way that you can uh, cache things when you need, um, and then also try to uh, run as many of these operations uh, at the same time um, to, to speed things up. So, um, uh, so that's kind of, you know, again, my pattern for using coroutines, making things really fast, and then also how to bridge to make sure that things work with the, um, the Micronaut caching system. Uh, one of the other questions I got was about testing the cache um, and my answer to that is is I'm not necessarily sure it's necessary to test the cache and I'll, and I'll tell you why um, well let me let me step back a little bit there are reasons to test but you're not really testing the cache you're really testing your configuration right so um, the cacheable annotation uh, has a way to configure uh, in your application.properties, right? Like how long things are cached, uh, things like that, right? So I can have different um, different caching times for different uh, things in my app. So quotes have a different um, caching 
uh, timeline or time frame than yield does or dividend history, recent dividends, right? So you can configure all that. And so when you're when you're thinking about writing a test, right, you're not testing that that the cash works, right? Because there's a whole bunch of tests in here that ensure that you know if you put cashable on on a function that it's that it's going to work or a method that it's going to work. Uh, but with that being said, you do or you may. Uh, depending uh, if, if you're so inclined to actually test that the cache and the timing is actually working. So I'll give you a, a, a couple couple thoughts on this, right? Um, if you're ever curious about how this works or, or, or maybe how to check it, uh, again, a good place is to go uh, into the source test for you know that, that thing and see how they do it, right? Um, I don't know if there's necessarily any tests in here. I'll bet you there are though. Um, test cacheable annotations with Jcash. Um, counter service. Let's see where counter service is. Yeah, so check this out. So this is, so I'll kind of walk you through a little bit what they're doing. So they've created a service um, and they put a bunch of counters in here, right? So they're just kind of counting values going up and down and they have different functions uh, with all of the various cache functions that they have. Uh, and what they do is then they just write a test and then they check what is in the cache. So if you wanna check if your caching is working, you can use those functions, manipulate um, that service and then check what is actually in the cache. Um, why would you do this? You would you would most likely want to do this, particularly if your, um, uh, or sorry, you you want to do this, or I would do this, uh, use this approach over potentially uh, one of uh, an approach that I got a question about is is. Um, would you do this by overriding the cache timing? and then uh, doing a thread that sleep in your test. I wouldn't recommend that, that'll make your test slow. So, you know, for example, maybe um, on my quotes, uh, normally I cache my quotes for say a minute, but in my test, I do it for five seconds, right? Um, and I'd put something in the cache and then I'd write thread that sleep and then I'd, you know, check the cache and see if it was still there, right? That's, that's how you could check it. Um, but again, that's introducing timing into your tests, which are flaky, and uh, it will also make your test slow. Uh, so this this method of you know writing a test and again just checking the state um, before and after you do your operations um, is going to yield you much 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 faster tests. It will and it will also actually um, you know ensure that your cache or your configuration. Um, is, uh, is set up the way that you want. Um, further, you don't necessarily have to spin up a whole server um, to actually test your cache, right? There's a bunch of different uh, ways that you can do this. You'll see here, you know, application context um, uh, here, and then basically, you know, getting a bean uh, or, or, you know, getting that counter service uh, from from the application context, so you don't actually have to spin up and run an entire server uh, to actually get and test uh, the functionality you're, that you're talking about, right? So, um, so that's really it. Uh, again, I've been using this to to great effect. It's made um, my APIs uh, much 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 faster across the board. I mean, my my. My response time, you know, in in most cases, is well under 100 to 150 milliseconds for even the most expensive um, of calls, where I'm getting tons of different data from different data sources. Um, and again, it's it's all thanks to one Micronaut and and the caching that's built in, um, two coroutines to help me actually, you know, speed up some of these functions and run more work. Uh, you know, at the same time, or do more work at the same time to try and get uh, get get data, um, and and then finally write this this nice bridge that's available in the coroutines feature 
or the, the Kotlin coroutines JDK 8 kind of um, compatibility package uh, that gives me the ability to change an actual coroutine scope into a um, into a completable future, right? So I can I can bridge that gap. Um, one last thing I think that's probably worth covering is this question of coroutines and threads and how they uh, mix and match. So uh, this is a pretty deep topic, but I think it's worth at least uh, taking a quick look at, right? Uh, so if um, I check what thread um, that I'm on here, right? And I'm running dispatchers.default. And so uh, this is more about what should I be putting in here uh, as, my, as my context, right? There's a couple different options. Uh, there's default, there's main. You probably aren't gonna use main unless you're in a uh, Android or Java FX or Swing app. Um, there's unconfined and then there's IO. Um, and I use primarily dispatchers.default, but in some cases I use dispatchers.io and, and we'll talk a little, I'll talk a little bit about why. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and just run this and you can see what the behavior is. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start from there. So you'll notice um, that the work was spread out across one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight different uh, eight different threads. Okay, and this is actually going to change depending on how beefy of a server or how big of a computer you have. Now I'm on a computer with a whole bunch of threads and a whole bunch of cores, so the vast majority of the work. Um, dispatchers.default uh, is basically backed by a thread pool that's equal to the number of CPU cores, but is at least two, right? Um, so because I have a bunch of threads, this is working on a whole bunch of different things. Now, if you do this and you are on a computer with maybe only one or two threads, um, you're probably gonna see some overlap in the, uh, in the threads that your work is running on. Uh, and so in that case, um, it, it, depending on the work that you're doing, it may or may not make sense to use IO instead. Um, and you can also control this at different layers, right? In this case, right, I might do something like this, um, but uh, I can't really demonstrate it here because I'm on a computer with a whole bunch of cores, um, but just, just, make sure that you, you take a look at this and you, and you understand this, right? In some cases, um, you can get much, much, much better performance, especially if your work is IO bound and you're not um, uh, waiting for a ton of stuff or, or your, your, most of your work is spent waiting for things like from a network or whatever. Um, and you're also using a non-blocking, uh, um, you know, uh, client or database driver or whatever, right? you can get vastly different performance characteristics by saying how many resources or how many threads um, can the kind of underlying coroutine uh, uh, engine, if you will, um, can, it, can it share its work, right? So by default, again, this is creating a, what's called a work stealing thread pool um, or a common pool. Uh, and it basically is looking at your um, uh, parallelism or the, the amount that uh, your computer can afford to, um, to do uh, and, then, and then does it based on that. So actually, let me see, we might be able to test this out. So yeah, so if I set this environment variable, um, I might be able to So let's actually debug this. Um, oh, it's gonna, yeah, it's never gonna hit that. Um, uh, maybe it does actually. 
Yeah, it's not actually gonna hit that. Um, yeah, okay, I don't think there's a good way to do this. Although there is probably a way to turn a, uh, turn a thread pool into a coroutine dispatcher. I'm pretty sure we can do that. Uh, I'm gonna find New single thread context won't do the trick. Yeah, new fixed thread pool context. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's we can we can I'll simulate this for us here. Um, uh, executor new. Fixed thread pull. So we're gonna limit um, this to two, right? So say I'm on a machine and I've only got you know one core or two cores or whatever. Um, I'm gonna say only do my work on this executor. I'll just get rid of this because it's not needed. So now when we run this, we're gonna see that this is actually the work is actually gonna uh, share between uh, only two. Um, two of these worker threads, not, you know, a whole bunch. So let's run this, at least it should. Yeah, so you'll see, right, all of this work is now only happening on two of these different things. Uh, and if I set it to four, right, we might get some sharing. Yeah, so now we're gonna get a little bit of sharing, right? Um, but but just just keep keep an eye on this, you know, make sure that particularly when you're trying to run a whole bunch of work at, at once, um, that you actually have uh, the ability uh, to run, you know, a bunch of stuff in parallel. Um, you're not, you know, causing more resource contention, things like that, right? Um, in my case, it's pretty easy because almost all of my work is I.O. bound. So as long as, um, you know, my functions are are asynchronous, um, uh, I'm usually usually in good shape. But um, just something to be aware of, right? If, if you're not necessarily familiar with coroutines, right? Coroutines, at the end of the day, just, you know, they all map down to threads um and and so you you do have to be a little careful and kind of know what you're doing um but uh you know obviously the resulting code that um coroutines help you write is is a lot easier and and gives you performance benefits right of uh um you know much much faster code in some cases if uh if you know what you're doing and your your problem um uh, has those needs so uh, that's about it. Uh, you know, if you have more questions, keep them coming. Um, and uh, we'll probably do another stream coming up here and we'll actually do some feature development and you'll probably see um, we'll implement some more features that, you know, essentially follow this pattern. So I'll go through it um, start to finish and you'll be able to check out um, how that actually all works and, and see it um, see it in action. So um, that's it for uh, for tonight. Um, we'll see you in the next one.